Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Judy, and I am a recovered alcoholic, and I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, For those of you who are new or who are counting days, um, I've had a, I've had deep and effective spiritual experiences as a result of, uh, of what, of doing the steps in this book. And um, so my sobriety date is February 5th, 2006. And I'm so, so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful for anybody who's new. I heard a couple people talking about um, they've relapsed and they're back. Just, you know, welcome back. I'm so grateful that you made it back. Um, this stuff really works. I mean, it really, really works. And it's not because I'm so proficient at doing the steps. It's not because, um, you know, I, I might, I I'm an eloquent speaker and you've had me back here twice. That's all. None of that matters. Um, this book is divinely inspired, no matter who you are or where you've come from or what your story is, or how many times you've relapsed you can do this stuff and it will work. It will always work because rarely have we seen a person fail who's followed this path thoroughly. Right. And I, um, my sponsor always says time takes time. You know, I'm 18 years sober and, uh, and I, and I, and I know, I remember um, what, what it felt like when I first got here. And I remember thinking like just not being able to sit still in my chair, looking around, wondering about what everybody was thinking about me, um, wondering if I made a mistake coming into AA. Like, did I did I really screw the pooch? Now I got to quit, like telling everybody, you know, um, telling everybody in my family and whatever that now I was going to AA. Like I felt trapped for a minute, like, Oh God, I, you know, I've really got to do this thing now. And if you're, uh, if you're experiencing some of these feelings, you know, I, I just want to tell you the story, um, and, and use what this reading to tell you the story of how I've been, I've been rescued, um, by a loving God from the disease of alcoholism and addiction. You know, I'm an alcoholic that also got addicted to drugs And um, so, I mean, I have a whole menagerie of perversion and addiction and, um, you know, bottom and darkness and crazy, you know, in my story. And uh, but it's mine. (laughs) It's all mine. And it's the only thing I have to offer you all all the only thing I have to offer. You know, I um, can't help you find a job and I can't lend you any money. But what I do have, I'll give to you freely, incessantly, without reservation, and I expect nothing in return, except maybe that you pass it on to the next person. You know, when I got here, my life was just such a mess. I I couldn't imagine life without alcohol. You know, I had started out in like this club thing where I was doing, go, doing going to raves and club music and, you know what I mean? Partying until nine o'clock in the morning. And I've even been to the UK. I was a, a, a house music artist and I performed at Ministry of Sound out there. And like, it was like a kind of a big deal. And I really thought that it was normal. I thought that I would be okay. And Man, I ended up on the rocks at 36 years old. You know, I I could not imagine life either with alcohol or without it. And I had no solution for my problem, you know. And when I came in here, I really thought that my problem was drinking. I really thought that my problem was drinking as it proved to be. Drinking is de- was definitely a problem. You know, I had nowhere to live because I kept getting thrown out of apartments and losing my job. I was unemployable because I couldn't keep a job for any length of time without a binge drink. And then something would inevitably happen where I would end up getting fired. Either I wouldn't show or I would come in late or I would get not get along with my boss. You know, these things kept happening to me in my mind. And I just kept hitting wall after wall after wall. And so coming to AA and doing what was suggested just seemed like such a shitty option. I was just like, oh, God, I can't believe this is my life. Like, are you kidding me? 
you know, like I, I really thank, thank God for the men and women who told me that it's just darkest before the dawn. And what I thought AA was, what I thought getting sober was, was completely different than what actually transpired in my life. So I took, I came to AA, um, I got a sponsor, I got a home group, and I got active in that home group. And it placed me in a position until I found a sponsor and started taking these steps, which wasn't long. I was on my fourth step by my 90-day celebration, you know, um, to to place myself in a position to see the truth about what alcoholism really was. And what I realized when I put alcohol and drugs and money and people into myself, because when I didn't have something else in my body, I was empty and I was alone and I was separate and I was different and I was deluded into believing that that stuff is true. I believed it with all my heart. Now that I'm sober on the other side of these steps, I realize that the fact, the, the idea that I'm different and separate and alone is the biggest lie that my addiction had to tell me. It had to tell me that. Otherwise, I wouldn't do what I did for alcohol and drugs. You know, and, I, and I've heard someone say, you know, I would... Uh, unless alcohol and drugs did for me what it did, which was, which was, you know, shut the chatter in my mind and make me feel like I was okay and make me feel like I was enough and take the pressure off and take the edge off. If it didn't do that for me, I would never allow it to do to me what it ended up doing to me, you know, but I allowed it to do to me what it, what I did, what it, what I did because of what it did for me. You know, it was the only answer I had ever found until I came to AA and until I had people tell me the truth and they placed me in position with these suggestions until I could take these steps. And so like getting back to the reading at the end of my 12 steps, I started doing the 12 step and I started sponsoring other women. And I really started reading what the one first 100 were saying. And I just feel like page 164 encapsulates that so well. Our book, this book, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, our Bible, our basic texts, right, is meant to be suggestive only. We realize that we know only a little. You know, we don't, we don't come to AA and stop with AA. You know, we have open minds. We've laid aside judgment about religion, about spiritual matters, about other books, right? It says that in our 11th step. It said there are many Many book, helpful books, um, and you can get these from where? From your priest, your minister, your rabbi. The assumption there is that I've used Alcoholics Anonymous as a launching pad to continue to grow in spiritual matters. That these steps ended up being steps to connection with God, steps to heaven for me. You know, steps to finding much of heaven, steps to having a real peace, steps to those ninth step promises, which tell me that that I'm going to lose fear of people and economic insecurity and that I'm going to I'm going to learn the word serenity and I'm going to know peace. You know, I couldn't do any of that, you know, ever in my life without a drink or a drug. And today I sit here. You know, I haven't I haven't put any mood or mind altering substances into my body, you know, and I accept the peace and the serenity as as well as I, you know, accept the calamity. And the, I lost my mother and my father, you know, in uh, in sobriety and I've lost jobs and I've lost relationships and I, all of that stuff has happened. But but it's it's God has taken it from from diminishing me to fortifying me. And that's the point of what it's telling us here. This book is the big, it's the tip of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. So if you're new, get into it. <laughs> Don't wait. Why would you want to be sick a minute longer than you have to? And then let that kind of catapult, let this, this newfound God that you're going to find as a result of these steps slingshot you into, into more into more. Do you have the disease of more? Why is it that we have the disease of more, except when it comes to God and 
and discipline and uh, doing doing what we're so, supposed to be doing, really looking at our life and honesty. And I'm telling my own story here. You know what I mean? Why is it that I'm, oh, I have the disease of more. I have the, I have the disease of more. Yeah, but I'm being, what's on offer here? What's on offer here is, is a loving, real relationship with the God that created me. And that this God that created me is going to give me all power and that spiritual principles are going to solve all of my problems. What am I waiting for? You know? So it goes on to say, we realize we know only a little tip of the iceberg. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. That's been my experience. God will constantly disclose more to me and he has more to you, but I, I gotta be in the mix, man. I gotta be. So if I'm coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm, and I'm using it as a revolving door and I'm making excuses for why I'm not doing my fourth step and I'm making excuses for why my upbringing, let me tell you something, upbringings are no joke. There was violence in my home. I, there was sexual abuse. There was all kinds of stuff going on. And, and the women I sponsor, I mean, you can't swing a cat in AA and not hit somebody who hasn't had some sort of traumatizing thing happen to them. But that's not what made me an alcoholic. I know I know women in, in my life that are not alcoholic that have had worse things happen to them than I did. And they're not drinking around the clock. You know what I mean? Dating drug dealers for cocaine. So I can't really use that as an excuse, you know? So what this book is telling me is that God is going to con- con- constantly disclose more to me and to you. So ask him in my morning meditation. There's this assumption by the time we get to page 164, which is the end of the studies of the 12 steps, that I have made a connection. And, and if, I, if I am an AA and I have 30 days, 60 days, 40 days, 80 days, 90 days, 100 and something days, two years, and I don't have a morning meditation, I'm not doing the deal. And I can't be mad about the results that I'm not getting from the work I won't do. So I want to be real careful about what I say Alcoholics Anonymous is, because I tried AA, it didn't work. No, you didn't. Most of the people that I have met, and I've been around, you know, I'm not saying that 18 years is a lifetime, but if it's a lifetime, it was my lifetime. You know, I'm sober longer than I drank. I know that much, you know. And I'll tell you that um, most of the people that I see that that had issues in AA have an issue with what this page is saying. Ask him in your morning meditation, make God the boss. You're no longer running the show. You've got to start taking your dictates from a higher power. You've got to start. You're not, you're not I I'm know. <laughs> being the queen of my life. I'm no actually pain. I'm I'm not the king and queen of my life. I'm actually a servant. I've actually got to get my orders from someplace else. Do you know why? Because left to my own devices, my, my, um, my sponsor said this to me the other day, cause I was complaining about how busy I was and I had a commitment for this. And then when I was done with that, I was speaking here and then I had to do something at church. And she's like, Judy, it's a blessing because when I'm, when you're, when you don't have things to do, all you do is sit around and worry about how much you weigh, how much money you have in the bank. I start thinking about me. I stick my head up my own ass and I begin to excavate. That's what happens when I'm not busy doing things for other people. Do you know what I mean? And that's what this book is saying. Ask him in your morning meditation, what? How to win a million dollars? How to have a better life? How to not be? No, it's saying, ask God in my morning meditation what I can do for the man who's still sick. Like this is the prospect here for the alcoholic that I'm going to suddenly wake up in the morning and enjoy that I must be constantly thinking about others and how I must meet their needs. That's what it says in this book. This book is yo, Judy, you've wrecked your life. You've wrapped it around a tree. You ain't much, but you're all you think about. Your best thinking gets you drunk or high or pants around your ankles, owing people money. Maybe it's time to put somebody else before you. And then I say, God, there's just no way I can do that. I don't know how. It doesn't come naturally. And then he says, let me show you how. Let me show you how. Wake up every morning, spend time with me, be in my presence, go to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, ask ask questions, read this book. And, and don't 
give me a hard time when I start leading you to maybe you want to check out that Bible study. Maybe you want to read Richard Rohr, Breathing Underwater with a couple of your girls. Maybe you want to get many helpful books also that you can obtain from your priest, minister, or rabbi. Maybe you're going to lay aside prejudice against religion, against God, against spiritual terms long enough to see that this book is not mincing words. This book is saying that if I don't allow these steps to walk me into the heart, mind, and function of the living God, I am not going to be okay. And I might not know that I'm not okay for five years, six years, 10 years, but I'm not okay because this disease tells me I don't have it. This disease, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, 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 I have this propensity to settle for just as much character building as will get me by and keep me sober. You know, it's like no virtue that I'm here. I'm not better than anyone else. I don't do this well. I'm not here because I'm virtuous. I'm here because, not because I, I can't drink. I'm here because I could drink. I'm here because I can, I could And I don't want that as badly today as I wanted it, as I wanted it when I first walked in, you know, but do I want to not drink badly enough to let God rearrange the furniture in my life? Because that's what it requires. Let's look back. It says the answers will come. Great. If your own house is in order, but obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. I can't help somebody if I'm still sick in my head and selfish, self-centered and thinking about me. Now, I'm not saying I'm Mother Teresa. I still suffer from this stuff, but today I have a solution. When I begin to think so much about myself that I become restless, irritable, and discontent, I can stop what I'm doing, pause when irritated or doubtful, Ask God for help and then reach out to another person because that's out, that's in here too. It tells me precisely what to do. There's four steps to take and then turn my attention towards someone like I know. I've been around 18 years. It has never failed. It doesn't fail, doesn't fail me. I fail it, right? See to it what? That my, rela- my, that my relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass. So all 12 steps equal one step. Where are you at with seeing to it that your relationship with him is right? Because if that's not the focus of my life, seeing to it that my relationship with him, and, I'll t- and I, t- I have sponsees on here and I tell them, see to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass. And if and when we start complaining about selfish and self-centered fears, wants, and desires, I say, how much time are you spending seeing to it, cultivating a relationship with him who's going to make great events come to pass? Right? And if the answer is, well, he gets 15 minutes in the morning and then I forget about him until I say the serenity prayer at some meeting... You know what I mean? I used to, when I, when I met my husband and we were dating, I used to text him around the clock, ladies. I mean, hi, just checking in, you know, hope you have a beautiful day. Oh, I saw these, I saw this show. Thought maybe you'd want to go with me. What are you doing later? Yeah. Okay. And he had zero power to save my life. And yet I can text God in the morning, like, sup, keep me sober. Talk to you later. Like, what is that about? So I'm a big proponent of this is a relationship, you know? And so it goes on to say, for you and countless others, this is the great fact. Abandon yourself to God. So the level of happiness, freedom, and serenity in your life is in direct proportion to your abandonment to God. And time takes time and you're not going to be as abandoned at 30 days as you're going to be at three years, as you're going to be at five years. That's when it tells us progress, not perfection. Do not be discouraged. But this is the goal, the point and the pinnacle of of this whole process is I'm not drinking and I'm so grateful and I'm not using drugs and I'm so grateful and I have a marriage and I have a we of women and a, and a network of women that are calling ourselves to hire that encourage one another that that want the best for one another do you know what I mean that lead each other to God and to the good things that God is doing or even when we have bad diagnoses or we lose our children or our parents were there saying, whatever you need, we're praying for you. If you can't get yourself to God, rest assured, we're getting you to God. 
We'll carry you if we have to. You know what I mean? Like this is the meaning and the central the, of my central fact of my entire life. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Abandon yourself. Step three. Admit your faults to him and your fellows. Step four and five. Clear away the wreckage of your past. <clears throat> Steps eight and nine. Give freely of what you find and join us. There's your 12th step. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit, not in the fellowship of the problem, not in the fellowship of the meeting makers make it, but in the fellowship of the spirit. Our hearts should be buried so deeply in the God we found that we meet other people there. You know, that when I, my sponsor was in the heart of God, the women I sponsor were seeking God. And so when I sought God, that's where I found them. In this place, on this road to happy destiny. So I hope I said something. And listen, I don't want to give you the impression that I do this, you know, perfectly. The book doesn't say that I should do it perfectly. But I'll tell you that I, that I know what love is. I'll tell you that I know what it feels like and I know what it is to be loved and accepted for who I am. And that didn't come from people. It comes from the most high God. It comes from this, this disease was allowed. I mean, this disease should have killed me, but God found me and took it and used it for my benefit and the benefit of others. Like this is the craziest thing. This is the, I don't deserve the life that I have based on my behaviors and the way that I lived. But I do deserve it based on the grace allotted to me. It just makes sense that the God of all grace, of all mercy, of all power that it talks about here, one who has all power, that God, thank you, God, that life isn't fair. You know, I came in here kvetching that life isn't fair and that's not fair. And why does she get to get married? And I don't get to get married and that they have a career, but I don't have a career. And if you, my mother does is, is nicer to my sister than she was nicer to me. Thank God that life isn't fair. Because if I got what I really deserved, I don't know where I would be. You know, this is a great program. You know, the program is the 12 steps. If you're not doing the 12 steps, then you're, you're not recovering. Not, you're not recovering. You're feeling okay. You're catching your breath. You're really just planning for your next relapse. That's it. You know, and, um, and meeting makers make meetings and I love meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, but we got to do better. We got to do better. We go to meetings to hear about the solution. We go to meetings so that we can, can fellowship with one another and talk about how to get better. You know, we're not there. It's not an extension of our intensive outpatient. It's not an extension of our rehabilitation or our detox where we sit around and talk about our day and our problems. That's not what Alcoholics Anonymous is for. We gather together to talk about our common solution and so that newcomers can find an answer and a way out. And so if you want a way out of your alcoholism and your, your racing thoughts and your self-absorption and your self-consciousness, and if you're willing to put your life in the hands of whatever God you find on this road, then I, then I offer to you that you are, you are on a road that is really going somewhere and that you will find much of heaven and that you will be rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence and that you will receive every single promise in this book. You know, um, because rarely, rarely has anybody who has really done this drank again. Anybody who has really done what page 164 says doesn't drink, doesn't do drugs, you know. So, I mean, I hope I said something that helps somebody. I love you guys. I'm just so grateful to be here. And may God bless you and keep you until we meet again. I wish you all happy sobriety, joy, and peace, and freedom, man. You know what I mean? Um, thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.